sick and the sick shall recover. And then when he finished reading that set, now don't you guys go out laying your hands on everybody because you're going to find that that does, oh, is that a fact? Is that why God called you to this Bible school? To read what Jesus said and then tell us he didn't know what he was talking about. You know what that guy's name was? Neither do I because nobody ever remembers stupid people. Can you say amen? <laughs> everybody say, I believe God. I believe God. And basically that's what you're going to fight in the United States of America is that people don't mind if you go to church and mainstream media doesn't mind if you go to church but if you start taking it seriously where you do the commands of the Bible and I'll add to that if you do the commands of the Bible and expect there to be a difference in your life compared to other people's lives that's what they mock on HBO and CNN you know this 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 prosperity message that they preach teaches that if you give you can expect God to give you something in return oh that's that was invented in Tulsa Oklahoma in 1970 I thought that was in I thought Jesus said that in Luke chapter 6 give not and you might receive give and you shall receive your gift will come back to you good measure pressed down shaken together and running over so that wasn't taught by Kenneth Hagin that was taught by Jesus and then a man named Kenneth Hagin read it, believed it, and teached it, taught it, teach not a word. <laughs> I've been knocking the education system a little bit. Maybe I should have like been a little more friendly towards it. I would know proper tenses to words. Amen. And then you notice, basically, the way to fly under the radar in the ministry is to teach people not to take the Bible literally. But then anybody that rises up and says that you can believe God to be your healer like he said, oh... This guy actually tells people that if they come to his meetings. No, no one's ever said if you come to my meeting, you'll be healed. People teach people out of the Bible that you can believe God to be who he said he'll be. And if you want a preacher who's going to tell you the opposite, you are going to really not enjoy this week of meetings. Because I can tell you that God is who he said he is. And God will do what he said he would do. God's power is not in question. Who will believe God is the only thing that's in question. Obviously, on Sunday night, I don't have to say, how many of you believe God? Obviously, you'd have stayed home if you didn't believe God. To go to church in the morning and then come back at night and have some of your friends in the neighborhood say, where are you going? Church. I thought you just went to church. I'm going back. Is it Easter? They're like checking their calendar on their phone. No. When you carry the power of God and make a decision that you're going to live by the Bible, it is a life-altering, and I'll go past that. It's a family-altering. That book got into the Shuttlesworth family and changed us. Changed every facet of our family and the way we operate. Because we made up our minds. We're not going to have an American version of Christianity. We're going to be old school. I'm not talking 1950. I'm talking before 1950. We're going to be first century book of Acts. Believers that do what they did in Acts. Pray, fast, seek God's face. Look at this church. Your church is privileged to have a pastor. Yeah. One of the only ones, that wasn't the part to amen, but whatever. <laughs> Your church is privileged to have a pastor that actually believes the Bible. When I see what he announces as series on Facebook, join us this month for we're going to be preaching on, on this subject. It's one of the only churches in the country that I see him advertise their messages where I think I'd actually like to go hear that. You hear what some people do as a series. You could get that from any 10 cent book in a library in pop psychology. This, we're going to do three keys to better managing your time. I don't need church to know how to manage my time. I have a Microsoft program for that. Can you say amen? amen. They deal with all these things that have nothing to do with God. Here, preach on healing, the gifts of the spirit, things that you'll actually latch hold on. And before you know it, you don't even realize it in the service. But you look back eight months later and think, man, I'm different. Yeah. Or somebody will actually come and tell you, you're different now. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you, when somebody comes up and takes their cigarette out of their mouth and says, you've changed, that shouldn't hurt your feelings. They might mean it as an insult. You know something? You've changed. You should go, praise the Lord. It took long enough. Amen. Because God's not looking to keep us where we're at. God is looking to change us from glory to glory, victory to victory, and strength to strength. That's where you're going in Jesus' name. I said that's where you're going in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. 
Why can't I dip in any of those other rivers? Why do I have to go dip in that river? It's almost like Elisha told him to take a dip in the Monongahela. Uh, any other body of water? But his officer tried to reason with him and said, Sir, if the prophet had told you to do something very difficult, wouldn't you have done it? So you should certainly obey him when he says simply, go and wash and be cured. So Naaman went down to the Jordan River and dipped himself seven times as the man of God had instructed him. And his skin became as healthy as the skin of a young child. And he was healed. I'm surprised on Christian television they haven't bottled the water from that river and sell it for your best gift. <laughs> you know why? Because it actually irritates me that they do that with anointing oil. This oil is mixed with the same ingredients that God said to mix. Who cares? Nowhere in the Bible was it ever taught that the oil itself was the thing that healed. It, oil can't cast out a devil. And the Bible says when the disciples went, they anointed them with oil. And any evil spirit, uh, any, any sickness or disease they had was healed and any evil spirit came out. Can you say amen? amen. Can you say better amen? amen? Good, that first one was like a Sunday night. I fought through a nap to be here, amen. So let me have one good amen. Can you say amen? amen. And so it's not that. And it wasn't the dipping. The water didn't make him better. The obedience, what's faith? Faith's acting on the word of God. Yes. Him acting on the instruction from the prophet Elisha. Got the elicited result. And so he was healed of an incurable skin con condition. Then Naaman and his entire party went back to find the man of God. They stood before him and Naaman said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. Yeah. Let me read one more scripture before him. We go past this. 2 Kings 13. Just a few pages later. 2 Kings 13, verse 20. Then Elisha died and was buried. Groups of Moabite raiders used to invade the land each spring. Once when some Israelites were burying a man, they spied a band of these raiders. So they hastily threw the corpse into the tomb of Elisha and fled. But as soon as the body touched Elisha's bones, the dead man revived and jumped to his feet. Bible says they were burying, they were moving Elisha's bones. Just his bones. And all of a sudden some raiders came. So it'd be like if it was like we were doing a burial service and you see ISIS coming over the hill. You think, you know what, let's cut the service shorter than we normally do. So they hastily took the body and just threw it in. And when it hit the bones of Elisha, the man jumped back to life. I bet you a few people needed a change of pants after that. In West Virginia, they laugh at that. If you say that up north, they, they, the three families storm out. I have never. So I'm glad to be amongst my people. Can you say amen? <laughs> I wanted to point out a couple of things from 2 Kings 5 that were interesting to me. Number one, the Bible says that this guy Naaman was like the General MacArthur of his day. Military mastermind that won battle after battle, yet he had a disease that he couldn't get healed from. And you find that today, especially if you minister like me. I've had the mayor of a city come and ask for prayer. So I went to pray for him. And he said, no, don't pray like that. Put your hands on me like you do to the other people. Well, you know, first of all, I was 36 at the time. And he's a mayor older than me. I'm not going to go and put my hands on him. I don't even know if he's saved. But he saw that power being released and wanted hands laid on him. I've noticed that people even that have great jobs, CEO of a company, Powerful military leader. I was reading a letter from Ronald Reagan this afternoon that he sent to his father-in-law, who was an unbeliever. And he told his father-in-law, basically he prefaced the letter with saying, I know you don't believe in God and you hate this kind of stuff, but let me tell you a story. He said, when I was governor of California, there it seemed like there were problems every day and it gave me an ulcer. He said it would range from general discomfort to sharp pains. I actually had a hole in this stomach. He said, I kept a bottle of Maalox in my car, in my office, and at home, and would have to use it all the time. And the pain was severe. He said, then one morning I woke up. This is Ronald Reagan. And I went to take the medicine, but I could tell I'd been healed. I have the letter right on my phone if you think I'm making this up. If I was going to make it up, I'd have made it like Abraham Lincoln, somebody like everybody likes. 
He said, so he wrote to his father-in-law. He said, so I went to the office that day and one of my staff said, just so you know, I want you to know that all your staff, we've been having prayer meetings and we pray for you every morning. And he said, when he said that, I knew that, that God had done that in answer to their prayer. So his father-in-law was facing some kind of, of major problem. He said, I know you don't believe in this, but what you need right now is God. And he said, I'm confident that God can do that for you. Now that was Ronald Reagan. Let's go to the other end of the spectrum. Anybody ever heard of a former heavyweight champion named Mike Tyson? Yes. I watched a, a documentary on three uh, boxers, Bernard Hopkins, Evander Holyfield, and Mike Tyson, one of the best documentaries I've ever seen. Now don't watch it because there's a bunch of cursing in it. And if you tell anyone I told you that I watched it, I'll deny it. <laughs> but I, uh, I, I did watch it. Although if you say I still will deny it, even though they now have me on video saying I watched it, I'll say that's CGI, that's not me. They were interviewing Mike Tyson, and I found this so interesting because, you know, even me as an evangelist that preaches that everybody's somebody to God, there's nobody that God can't save. The same God that saved Saul on the road to Damascus can save anybody. You know, still you see some people and you think, I don't know about that guy. And Mike Tyson, you know, does not seem like the easiest win to the Lord that you'd ever have. Yeah. Just put it that way. He told a story on that documentary that he had a child who had an accident got tangled up on, on a, one of those uh, jogging machines and, and hung himself and it cut off oxygen to the brain. And he said, when I was standing there, it was the first time in my life that I felt powerless. My child's laying there on life support. And he said, I was standing there and that was the first time. He said, you know, anything else I could punch or kick, but this I can't do anything to. And he said, all of a sudden, this other couple came over and said, excuse me, sir. I know you're going through a hard time. Our daughter's right there too. They had a daughter in, in the NICU. They said, would you mind if we prayed for you? And he said, they prayed for me. And I never, he said, I felt something I've never felt before. Everybody say the anointing. anointing. Everybody say the anointing. Because uh, the first time I felt like I was asking people at an Elks club to participate in a religious service. <laughs> he said, I felt something I never felt before. And they prayed for me. And when they went back to their bed, I thought to myself, who are you, Mike Tyson, that you're all mad going through this and these people are going through the same thing as you and actually took time away from their dying child to ask if they could pray for me? He said, I've never experienced that. So what does that show you? Heavyweight champ, governor, president, military leader. You're going to find out. It doesn't matter how smart you are or what position you hold. You will come up against something in life. That if God's not on your side, like that king said in 2 Kings 5, they brought a leper to the king. He said, what do you want me to do? Am I God that I can give life or take it away? There's another place in the Bible, same thing. Somebody said, I'm starving and I don't know what to do. The king said, if God can't help you, what am I supposed to do? People, it doesn't matter what it says on their name tag or what elected position they have. There is a spiritual element to life. That if you don't have the power of God, when you face an attack, that attack will be greater than what you can face. You know, it's one of the, the, the hardest things. I would say the hardest group of people, though you can do it, and I've done it, to lead to the Lord are university students. Because they know everything. You know, 18, 19, you haven't had like to face. Some people have, but some haven't. Many haven't. But you notice you get to prison. Preaching to 30-year-olds. I've never had one of those prisoners sneeringly make a comment. When people are up against something that's too big for them, whether they've been a professed atheist their whole life or not, they start to realize that there's something that they need that they don't have. That something is not only God, that something is the power of God. God created man. Not just to have a relationship with him. God created man to have a relationship with him and carry his power to the people that are around them. Everything that God wants done on the earth requires two things. The hand of God and the hand of man in equal parts. Well, I believe if God wants it done. No, that's not how it works. I sought for a man to rebuild the wall of righteousness in a nation, but I couldn't find anyone. So the nation was destroyed. Who can I send as a messenger for me? Isaiah 6. And who will go to my people? And Isaiah said, here I am, Lord. Send me. You're going to find every great story in the Bible, in world history. 
is somebody hearing a call from God and responding to that call and God taking them on a journey to carry his power to a lost and broken world. If you'll open your ears and eyes, it's actually not hard to lead people to the Lord. I used to think anything you're bad at you think's hard. I think it's hard to fix a car because I don't know how to fix one. But one of you guys could show me and probably over the course of the next 13 years I would slowly learn how to do it because I'm really, really bad at it. Ask my wife when she comes tomorrow night. She's the Puerto Rican with the huge hoop earrings. Amen. <laughs> I used to think it's difficult to get people saved. And you listen to the way Christians talk. Christianity post. Christian, we're in a post-Christian society. People don't know God. You know, people aren't interested in God. You're going to find it's the opposite. How many of you were here this morning? We, we, we have that event. Over 9,000 people show up. And we had to estimate how many people came forward to receive Jesus Christ because we ran out of space at the altar. People started to yell because they were getting pressed up against the gate. And we had to say no one else can come to the altar. So then 900 at the altar and we just estimated how many people prayed the prayer behind that. Somewhere between 12 and 1,700 people gave their lives to Jesus Christ. That was in Newark, New Jersey. No. I think the week after that, the week after that, I was in Ahoski, North Carolina. And uh, I was staying in a place called Edenton, North Carolina, middle of nowhere. The only restaurant was a McDonald's, uh, I think. That, I mean, there might have been one other one. The only one that was open, though, after, after lunch was the McDonald's. So I swung through to get something to eat. And as I'm going, the lady that's serving me my food in the second window, she had the most cheery disposition of any McDonald's worker, and I've been to them all, all over the world. I'm a McDonald's connoisseur. When you're at a certain income bracket, that's, you don't have to ask where should we eat. That's the only option. And I'm not there anymore, but I was there for a long time. I go to McDonald's. This lady's the cheeriest lady. Here's your food, sir. It'll just be one minute on your drink. Hope you're having a nice day with, like, joy in her eyes. I said, you, are you a born-again Christian? Uh, nobody could be that happy and, and unsaved. Half the saved people you meet aren't that happy. I said, uh, are you, you must be a born-again Christian. Look how happy you are. She said, no, I'm not, but I sure would like to be. I thought I was in one of those cheesy witnessing videos. <laughs> they used to show us those witnessing videos in Assemblies of God churches on how to share your faith at work. And the video would start off, Bob, I've noticed such a tremendous change and a joy in you. Will you share with me how you got it? You think, that never happens. But actually, if you'll pray and ask God to carry his power and use you to take people that are battling the hardest things they've ever been through and use you to pull them out of that and bring them answers. My mother was just telling me on the phone. It's actually, uh, uh, if you watch me in the morning, we do that broadcast 10 to 11. And starting tomorrow, after we go off air on TV, I'm going to do another half hour on Facebook and just pray. I'll pray on, on camera and people can pray with us. I'll have Kofi help me. This is the first he's hearing it. Because I've realized, I heard my cousin Teddy that's been here to preach put it this way one time. It's about the best way you can put it. If you've ever done dishes, say you have a plate of, of pasta with the red sauce dried on, and you try to scrub it off with no water, you can do it, but it'll take a long time. But if you let it soak in dish detergent long enough, you can pull it off and just rinse it right off. And if there's any left, it'll wipe right off. I would say that's how... You can, you can talk about prayer or doing things without prayer. You can go about witnessing. I just saw they were having a revival meeting under another denomination that doesn't believe in the Holy Spirit. They were featured on CBN. And they said there's been 700 decisions for Christ in almost 721 weeks of meetings. They're in their week 21. 700 people saved in 21 weeks? Do the math on that. I'm telling you, like, actually do the math because I can't. <laughs> I think that, what, what is that, 35 a week, and you're doing services every night. That's six decisions for Christ per night. Felt like right now back and saying, is there a minefield between the seats and the altar? When you do things without the Holy Spirit, things are slow. Things, you can get them done, but they take forever. But when you move with the Holy Ghost... God can take instead of you scrubbing the red sauce off. It's like the results just come. Can you say amen? amen. My mother told me that she, she had been thinking, which obviously it's the Holy Spirit bringing it to her heart, how when she first got saved, she used to ride in a pickup truck 
all around where I live now in Oakdale, Pennsylvania, and go door to door witnessing, and in New Jersey when she lived there as a teenager. Go door to door, knock on the door during that Jesus movement in the 70s. Hello, has anyone ever told you Jesus loves you? We'd love to have you come to church. They'd load a pickup truck back in the days when you could actually have people sit anywhere they wanted in a car. Can you say amen? You didn't have to have your daughter strapped into an $1,100 device. So they'd pack it and put everybody in the pickup truck. My mom turned 60 last year. She said, I was thinking, when did I stop doing that? I used to do that all the time when I first got saved. Now I don't bring anybody to church. So I started to pray. Everybody say prayer. prayer. I started to pray and ask the Lord, use me to start doing that again. Help me to witness. Now in Maine, that takes a lot of faith. You can live in a house in Maine for 25 years in a neighborhood and never meet your neighbors one time. I'm telling you the truth. One time my mother was walking on a walk. She told me this. You know, we're from Pennsylvania. Down here, you're friendly to people. She was up there. She waved at her neighbor. Hello. He looked at her, put down what he was doing, and went back in the house. Never even said hello. So, you know, if you can't get somebody to say hello to you, getting them to come to church is more difficult, not less difficult. So even in Maine, my mother starts praying, Father, make me a soul winner again. Use me by your spirit to win souls. She said, I kid you not, Jonathan. The next day, I went out on my walk with their golden retriever. She said, I went on my walk. And this guy was standing outside. And he said, excuse me, to my mother. My mother said, yes. Don't you and your husband go to church? She said, yes. He said, you know, I've been thinking I need to go to church. And I wanted to know uh, if you would mind if I come to your church with you. That's prayer. At that drive through window in McDonald's. I'd like to be. I'm not a Christian, but I'd like to be. I stuck my hand right through the window. I said, grab my hand. She took my hand. She was in her early 20s. I said, pray this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, I'm sorry for my sins. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for me. There were people backed up behind me, but if they were smart, they won't honk. Because I have a little bit of Old Testament mixed in with my New Testament. Amen. I said, pray this prayer with me. Let her in the prayer. She prayed it from her heart. With my hand through the drive through window, who knows what the people behind us thought. I'm like, it looks like you're like assaulting an employee. <laughs> and then when she finished praying, you know how I was thinking, well, I have to go. I can't stand here and do a one-week discipleship course through my window in the drive through window. I said, uh, now listen, I have to go, but you must be in church this Sunday. I said, promise me that you'll be in church. The other worker came up behind her and went, I'll make sure she's in church with me. So the Holy Spirit that provided the opportunity also provided a follow-up team right off the bat. Can you say amen? (laughs) Say this with me. Say, by myself. I can't do anything. And in old traditional church, that's where they would leave it. How many of you know we can't do anything? He, no, that's not where it ends. Jesus said, in yourselves, you can do nothing. So that's why I lean on the Holy People think you're, I'm too heavy on the Holy Ghost. You know, kind of back off a little bit. But I want to tell you, Jesus didn't say, if he said, without me, you can do less. Then maybe I wouldn't be so heavy on it. But he said, without me, you can do nothing. So that lets me know right up front, if I start thinking I'm smart and I have a nice suit, I know how to speak in public. I don't really need God's help anymore. I'll just do my own thing. It won't accomplish less. I would crash so fast that people would know the same way my rise was divine, my decline would be divine. Can you say amen? But he said, but you don't leave it there. You don't end up an old depressed Pentecostal. I mean, you know, we can't do anything at all. It's only, no. Without me, you can do nothing. But Paul said in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things. Through Christ, who strengthens me. Say that out loud so the devil can hear you. Say, I can do all things. Through Christ, who strengthens me. Now lift both hands up and try to say it like you didn't pass away 10 days ago. Say, I can do all things. Through Christ, who strengthens me. Now with your hands lifted, just begin to thank God that he's going to use you in this last day plan. That you're not going to watch God move in your nation. You're going to be a part of God moving in your generation. Begin to thank him out of your mouth, from your spirit. Thank you, Lord. What a mighty God. We thank you, Father. We give you praise. 
In Jesus' name, everybody said. In Jesus' name, everybody said a loud amen. 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 Now, when you make up your mind, it's not up to God. It's your choice. Bible says God's will is to pour out his spirit on all flesh. What does that mean? It means all flesh. It means he won't turn anybody down. God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. How was Elisha able to help when a king couldn't help? Well, the Bible tells you something about Elisha. He not only knew about God. He carried God's power in his body to the point that after he was dead, they threw a body that was dead and his bones had enough left over of the glory of God to jerk that fellow back to life. Was Elisha in the old covenant or the new covenant? Old covenant. We're under the new covenant. Is the new covenant worse or better than the old covenant? That's right. Despite what they tell you on Christian television, it's actually better. Bible says in Hebrews 8, 6, we now have a better covenant built on better promises. We have Christ living on the inside of us. So when you see what men were able to do under the old covenant, Elijah calling fire down from heaven. And the Bible says in James 5, Elijah was a human being just like us, subject to like passions. But when he prayed, God answered him. God isn't showing you these people. You have to look at it in the Bible. No, but people didn't like them. The king didn't like them. They weren't revered then. They're revered now. Back then, they were, here's Israel's troublemaker. They felt about them the same way they think about preachers now. I've said before, and I'm not joking. People always laugh. When people ask me on an airplane, what do I do for a living? I'm going to start telling them I'm an assassin. <laughs> because I feel like it would get a more favorable response than preacher. You say, what, so what is it you do for a living? I'm a preacher. A ah, preacher! Spit their champagne out. Yeah, I'm a preacher. Wow, sitting up here in first class. Thought you were supposed to give all your money to the bar. Ah! Ah! 30 years of public school trying to indoctrinate people to hate God, hate anything that has to do with God and the church. We need to start taxing the church. They start taking in too, they're taking too much money on tax. The trillions of dollars possibly that we could tax. If you tax the church, you'll lose that money the same you lost all the other money. There's no shortage of revenue in the United States. If you put the federal government in charge of the Sahara Desert, there'd be a shortage of sand in five years. Can you say amen? amen. They didn't like Elisha. Here's Israel's troublemaker. They were, these were not guys walking around with glowing beams of light around their head like in a Catholic church. <laughs> Bible says they were just as human as we are. They were men that believed God, believed his word, would have the boldness to speak his word and see what they said come to pass. And God will raise up a new generation tonight of men and women in West Virginia that don't just, listen, that aren't just church attenders. They know God and they carry his power to a new generation. If you're going to be one of those people, clap those hands one more time unto God and give him a mighty shout. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. What happens when you make a decision to carry God's power? Turn to Acts chapter 1. Acts the first chapter. Acts 1 verse 4. Once when Jesus was eating with them, he commanded them, don't leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift that he promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Verse 8, and you will receive power. Who will receive power? You. It's the only religion where the God claims that he'll share his power with the people that follow him. Every other religion, the God doesn't even like the people. You bring me coconuts every day to this idol or I'll curse you. I'm telling you. I preached that when I was in another country. Came up out of my spirit. I said, you people have been running coconuts to that statue for thousands of years. 
You're poor. Your parents are poor. Your grandparents were poor. What has that idol ever done for any of you? You start talking like that, you better be anointed or you're going to die. But I'm anointed. In fact, I'll tell you the rest of that story. I'm preaching like that, you know, and then when you start doing it, you just get carried away. Start in, I was insulting idols left and right. Those things aren't, don't even look nice. They're ugly as can be. I said they're blind, they can't see. You know, God did that in the Old Testament. These idols are blind and can't see. Deaf and can't hear. But I'm not, I'm a living God. We serve a living God. Can you say amen? amen? Hallelujah. So I'm preaching like that. And the building was unfinished. So it'd be like we were preaching here and they had the roof and these, these concrete uh, doohickeys, I think they're called. I was never much for architecture. It'd be like if all these were up in the roof and the floor, but then outside you could hear everything. And there's a village preaching out in another country. And as I'm preaching against idol worship, I'm getting carried away. These idols are weak. I'm reading all the scriptures and quoting them about thou shalt have no other gods before me. You won't worship things that are fashioned by human hands. Worship only the Lord. Start preaching on the anointing and God's power like I'm preaching tonight. And then I give an altar call. I said, bring everybody. Well, what happened was, as it's going into the village, people grabbed a friend, like the Bible, that's bedridden, and bring him to the meeting. Then when I gave the call to get healed, they bring him up, carry him on the bed, carried him up three flights of stairs, and then carried him to the altar. I anointed everybody with oil, anointed him. He never moved, paralyzed from the neck down. And that's the, like the least of his problems. He, he was like dying, you know, under 100 pounds, laying in bed, had that look of death where your face is all drawn in and the mouth is always open. I poured oil on him, nothing happened. So I came back again. I was leaving in the morning. No use sparing any oil. Poured the whole thing. I thought, well, you're going to die anyway. What's the difference if you get drowned in anointing oil? Amen. <laughs> I poured over and poor guy knows that. Blah, 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 blah. You know, he's like jerking his head trying to get away. But anytime I'm in a meeting with no video cameras, I do what I want. Of course, we're being recorded here, so you have no worries. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. That guy stayed just like he was. But, you know, God touched people. They got saved. I was ticked off that they had to carry that guy back out. I go and leave the meeting, and one of the ushers said, Do you know what happened when you were preaching against idol worship? I said, No. He said, Some men came to kill you. I said, Oh. Do you know where they live so I can give them a thank you card? Thank you for not killing me. I said, how come they didn't come up and kill me? He said, well, they were waiting for others to join them. That's how you know it's the anointing. If they could have seen me, they would have realized they didn't have to wait for others. <laughs> Any 14-year-old girl that plays softball could give me a run for my money. Amen. <laughs> Listen, over there, you know, fasting, hadn't had anything to eat in three days. You don't need a team of people to beat me up. I'm not Steven Seagal from 1991. <laughs> He said they were waiting for other people from the village to join them. And as they waited for you to join them, for others to join them, hallelujah, when they finally arrived, they said, wait, let's sit down and just listen to the rest of what he has to say. He said, and then about half the group went back home and half the group came up and got saved. Can you say amen? amen. What about that guy that was paralyzed from the neck down? Irritated me that I could preach that long in a foreign country Tell those people how great my God was, and then when I went to act on it, nothing happened. So I went home, and on my way home, when I got home, I told the Lord, I said, Father, I'm going to go on a 21-day fast for one reason. I want that to be the last person that people ever bring for help that leaves with no help. In Jesus' name, I'm on day 9, day 10, day 11, I get a text message from the pastor's wife in India. Do you remember that man that you prayed for that was bedridden? I do. He said uh, his caretaker went in to go feed him in the morning, the morning after you left, and he was standing up next to the bed like this. And then the next day, he started to walk on his own. They said word got out through the whole community, and now we actually have had to start doing a healing service every morning for all of the sick people that are being brought to church. I meant to tell you sooner. Gee, thanks. <laughs> I'm over here in Pennsylvania starving to death because you can't clear out 10 minutes to fire off a text message. Everybody say the anointing. The anointing. Always, works. Always works. 
And say this, I'm going to carry the anointing. If you watch us do our broadcast, our broadcast is different than most broadcasts for one reason. We don't ask people to send in prayer requests. We teach people to pray and have them send in their testimonies. Because if God wanted you to know somebody who would keep you in prayer, he never would have sent Jesus. The old system was that there's a high priest. You go to him, tell him your problem, and then he comes in and takes it before the Lord. And somehow, then Catholicism did that. Then the Protestants rebelled against Catholicism, and now they do it worse than the Catholics. You turn on the Catholic network, EWTN, they're not selling anything. You turn on the Christian network, they're selling everything that's not nailed down. If they ever find the Ark of the Covenant, they'll be selling one by one inch pieces of it for your best love gift. <laughs> Chop it up and sell it. And then what do they say? Now instead of going to the priest and confessional, it's called the 800 number at the bottom of the screen. Our prayer partners are standing by to pray with you right now. Pray for you. Do you know why Jesus came? The Bible says when Jesus came and he said, Lamai, Lamai, Eloi Sabachthani, and gave up the ghost, the veil that was in the temple that separated man from God was torn from top to bottom, supernaturally, that man could now go in by the blood of Jesus Christ into the Holy of Holies with boldness and obtain answers in the time that they need help. I know Pastor Luke's been diligent to have multi-day meetings. I'm not the first one that's come through. How come you have six nights of meetings? Yeah, people are busy. Actually, people are the least busy they've ever been. I have a, a graph I could show you. Housework used to take 90 hours a week. And housework now takes eight hours a week. I heard somebody say, wow. I'm glad you were also able to learn about the invention of the, answer, of the uh, washing machine tonight. There's many great things that have happened. Housework used to take years. That's why people used to have 11 kids. You needed a workforce. As <laughs> soon as they'd start talking, you'd hand them a, a walking. Hey, you took your first steps. Here's a rake. Get to work. <laughs> people have all kinds of time. That's how you end up with an online boyfriend or girlfriend while you have a wife. That's how people end up in all the problems they're in. They've got a plenty of time. That's why TV ratings are through the roof. Not because people are busy. People have plenty of time. And when you invest time in the house of God, what God wants to do. See, that's what revival meetings are. This is not who needs a miracle, come get a touch and then go back. This is God building something in your spirit. So that instead of there being me, Pastor Luke, Kofi, a few others that know how to pray and you come give them their requests. Imagine tonight if you turn out a few hundred people. I mean, just the teenagers that are here. If you took this small pack of teenagers, got them lit on fire with the Holy Ghost, and sent them to public school, the devil wouldn't know what hit him by noon tomorrow. God is looking to share his power with you. It's not why I'll take it easy now. You only just started coming to church back in April. No. God will use you right now. I mean, good Lord. There was a man in Mark chapter 5 who was full of 2,000 demons. You think you have problems. He had major problems. That's like three 757 planes worth of demons all living on the inside of him. And he was so violent that he couldn't even keep clothes on. He'd tear his clothes off. They would try to chain him in the cemetery and he'd break the chains and go assault people. But when Jesus stepped on the shore, there must have been a shockwave of the anointing that went out. And that guy ran not to attack Jesus. That guy ran to worship Jesus. Jesus cast the devils out, 2,000 with one word. So anytime that somebody has to be dragged to a back room and they do it for six hours, they're not doing it right. Can you say amen? Amen. And when he got done, the man said, Jesus, let me travel with you. Jesus said, no. Go back into the town you came from and tell everybody, not have someone tell them for you because you just got, you know, you really just got right. No, go back right now and start telling everybody what the Lord did for you. And people say, I don't know that I could ever witness. You know, God could do something for you tonight. Some of you are so well known. 
for what problem you have. Everybody knows that so-and-so died, and since then you've been sad, that this happened, you know, you're a recovering whatever, that God could do something for you tonight. And just you telling that story would release faith in people, and they would receive a touch from God on their own. You know, I don't know how to speak in public. You can't mess up your own testimony. And God wants to give you a testimony. I said God wants to give you a testimony. Well, you don't have to tell people. I, I, I think I believe God. You say, listen, there's no question there's a God. Because I used to be like this. And now I'm like this. And only Jesus could do that. I pray tonight that every person would leave, not just carrying the power of God, but with a testimony that what took 15 years, you could never get rid of it. God did it tonight and made you a billboard that his power still works in our generation. If you receive that, put those hands together again and give God a mighty shout. Everybody say this, I will receive power. I will receive power. After, that, the Holy Ghost comes me. After that, the Holy Ghost comes upon me. Say it again, I will receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost comes upon me. Now I'm going to tell you, if you'll keep that as your focus, you'll be different. Because from K-Love Radio to everything else in this country, they train you to be weakness focused. How many of you know no, we're not weak? Speak for yourself. I'm not weak. Where I was weak, now I am. Let the weak say, not let the weak believe. Let the weak say what? I'm strong. I'm going to ask you a question. Instead of starting your week off tomorrow, the way you're trained to in church, you either do nothing or how many of you know we're nothing? He's everything. No, I'm not nothing. Jesus didn't die for nothing. I'm a man created in the image of God and I'm set apart for this final hour to be used by the hand of God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Imagine how different your life would be if you woke up in the morning, looked at yourself in the mirror, lifted your hands and said, thank you, Father, that I carry your power, that your spirit resides in that man in the mirror. And wherever I go, your spirit goes because you live on the inside of me. Man, you, you start having a different life. When you're, see, because then it gets you conscious, not that God's up here somewhere, that Christ liveth in me. Amen. So when your coworker tells you they have a problem, I don't know what I'm going to do. You say, I can help you. No, I don't just bring it up. I don't know how God will do something. I also have the same problem. It's actually worse than yours. You should come to church with me. No, I'm already messed up enough. Thank you. But when you start seeing yourself that you're a solution, turn to the book of Obadiah. Or I should say, pretend to turn to the book of Obadiah because no one knows where Obadiah is. Even me, preaching for 16 years, you notice I'm turning to the table of contents. 859. I'm sure Obadiah thinks I preach too long up in heaven. I'm sure Obadiah thinks everyone preaches too long. Because Obadiah could say everything he needed to say in 21 verses. If you would put that up in, the, if you have the ability to do scripture, put it up in the King James. If you can't, it's okay. Anybody have a King James or New King James? If I was in Alabama, I'd be like, oh, thanks. You are. Oh, I was going to say you switched. <laughs> then saviors, small s, then saviors shall come to Mount Zion, or come from Mount Zion, to judge the mountains of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Then saviors. Everybody say saviors. Hey. Everybody say small s. small s. Anytime you start using those terms, people get freaked out. There's only one savior. Not according to Obadiah. Everybody say this from the Bible. Say, Christ is the head. Christ is the head. Say, we are the, body. we are the body. So it's not difficult to understand that what he is, we now are. Anything you can't say about Christ, 
you can't say about a Christian. And anything you can say about Christ, you can say about a spirit-filled believer. So uh, you can hear it getting quiet because obviously, you know, people grew up in traditional church, traditional Pentecostal church. He, I mean, if you know, he's not, we're nothing. Oh, I don't know why you even love us. No, that's not the Bible. The Bible is, everyone say this, I am redeemed. redeemed. The Bible is, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, not a patched up sinner. The old life is dead. The old life is? I'm a recovering addict. Quit recovering and just recover. God doesn't patch up sinners. In the Greek, it's if any man be in Christ, he is a new species of being. The old life is dead. Say the old life is dead. dead. Hey, you should come out with us. I don't go out anymore and do that. Yo, you, you, you always would come out with us. No, that was a lady that looked like me. I killed her Sunday night myself. It's no longer I that liveth, but Christ lives in me. I said, it's no longer I that liveth. But Christ lives in me. It's no longer I that liveth, but Christ liveth in me. Can you say amen? Amen. Can you say a better amen? Amen. And so when you stop looking at yourself with all your failures, one thing, you know, Pastor Luke and I met at youth camp in Pennsylvania back when he was the youth pastor. And he'll tell you, if you've done youth ministry, it amazes me how you can meet teenagers and within 30 seconds of talking to them, they just tell you, you know, hi, my name's, my name's um, Anika. I don't test well. I have a short, I'm not a good with short-term learning. And meanwhile, who knows whether any of that's true? Because well, you had your eighth grade guidance counselor give you some form test. Maybe your teacher just stinks. Do you ever think of that? That's what I always thought. You don't test well. No, you, you, you do a terrible at your job. I'm actually fine. <laughs> Can you say Amen. I, I don't test well, and um, I don't have, I don't remember well for tests, and I have uh, attention deficit. When I was started preaching, it was ADD. Now it's ADHD, which when I first heard that, I thought that was attention deficit in high definition. <laughs> Maybe there'll be AD 4K, AD virtual reality. I have ADHD. I, I have an energy problem. Meanwhile, you know, they wanted to put me on ADD medication when I was little. He doesn't sit still. He, let, he wants to run around all the time. Yeah, it's called being a boy. It's called testosterone. Jonathan, will you pray for my son? He won't, his teachers say he won't sit still in math class. Maybe he won't be an accountant. Everybody's not good at everything. I had one lady come up to me. Jonathan, will you pray for my son? I always ask, what for? What for? Well, he likes to fight. I said, I'm not going to pray about that. Imagine if Samson's mother took him up and said, you pray my son likes to fight? Israel would have got wiped off the face of the earth. (laughs) When I said that to his mom, the kid went went from not liking preachers to really, he went, (laughs) who is this man? (laughs) I said, said, "Uh, young man, I'm not going to pray that God takes away your desire to fight. You need that actually. I said, I'm just going to pray that you'll never be dumb enough to do it for free again. I said, let me tell you something. You like to fight? Yeah. I said, join a gym. There's people that sign up to be sparring partners for God knows what reason. I met a guy. He said, I train with UFC fighters. I said, are you a UFC fighter? No. I let them spar with me. That sounds like the worst job in the history of all jobs. (laughs) Hey, does anybody need somebody uh, to kick in the head? Because I'm here today. (laughs) Put it right here. I said, you know, you can make a lot of money fighting. I actually have, it's amazing. When you start preaching like this, I have two UFC fighters that not only follow me on social media, one's the champion in his weight class. He retweets what I write. Why? Because it's not some sissified, I'm trying to think of words you can say in church. <laughs> That's why I like preaching outside. You can just say whatever you want. I had someone come to me one time and say, you, you shouldn't talk like that in church. I said, we're not in church, we're outside. Amen. <laughs> it's not some gospel that turns this Bible into a Kleenex box to dry your tears as the devil kicks your head in. No. 
The Bible is not the tissue box of the Spirit. The Bible is the sword of the Spirit that puts a power in you to go to war against what the devil's trying to do to you, to your family, to your business, and prevail in every battle of life. Hey, I see you prevailing in every battle of life, not by might, not by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. If you receive that, take 30 seconds, clap your hands, all ye people, and shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Hallelujah! Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah! Say this, I'm not anointed to fail. I know you didn't like that first part, I'm glad. Say, I'm not, we'll make it all one second. Say, I'm not anointed to fail. I'm anointed to be victorious. And now say this, say, my generation depends on it. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost comes upon you. You can't do anything without the power of God. That's why you, you call for prayer. How many of you need prayer tonight? Every Christian raised their hand. Every sinner raised their hand. Got the same amount of Christians and sinners in the hospital. Same amount to get a loan from the car title loan place. So it's no wonder this is openly mocked. If you don't see a difference between believers and unbelievers, then the devil's able to run that garbage out of his mouth. What difference? You know, they don't live any different. Let me tell you, if you get a hold of this, religion won't make you any different. Religion's a box you'll check on the U.S. Census form. Protestant. Catholic. Really, I'm Protestant, but I'll check Catholic because my mother-in-law is looking over my shoulder. <laughs> it's just, uh, what faith are you? I'm a Catholic faith. There's no Catholic faith. There's no Baptist faith. There's no Assemblies of God faith. There's holy faith birthed by the Spirit through the Word that's been passed down, the Bible says, from our forefathers. Paul told Timothy, Timothy, I call into remembrance your unfeigned faith that was with your grandmother Lois, your mother Eunice, and now resides in you. I was walking down a hallway in Allentown, Pennsylvania at a hotel. And I was going to teach or preach that morning on the power of your words and lining up your mouth with the Bible. And as I walked down the hall to the elevator, I passed a room. And it was a grandfather, his son, and his grandson. Grandfather was probably 70. Son was probably 45 or 50. And then uh, the kid was little, 9, 10. And as I'm walking by, looking at my notes on the death and life being in the power of the tongue, what you say, what you speak to your family. It was like the Lord was just doing it as an illustration to tell me how important it was to preach. Guy opens the door and says back into his son and grandson, every year you get older, your body hurts more. You'll see, life gets harder as you get older. You know, that's why I looked back to see who's in the room. I wanted to see if Lucifer had checked into the same hotel with me. <laughs> when I heard that, I want to tell you, next week I go up to visit my parents on Saturday. And I'm going to bring them both big gifts. I've actually been believing for money to come in to get them the kind of gift I want. And it's about all in. I told the Lord about 10 days ago, everything that comes in from now to when I leave on that trip goes to my mom and dad. Because like I told you this morning about going to that amusement park. See, parents smoking, saying stupid stuff to their children. You know, just the fact that my mom and dad didn't mess me up in the womb and then mess me up after the womb. Here, some guy in Pittsburgh choked his two-year-old son to death because he, he wouldn't finish his meal. So there's things when I didn't have any power to fight back. You took care of me and got me to where I'm at now. That's worth honoring. The fact that you're not dead, anything else your parents do, doesn't cancel that out. Can you say amen? amen? You start taking for granted. Just the fact that they fed you, didn't abandon you in a dumpster, like you hear people doing now. I've been watching that show, Forensic Files. I got a brand new appreciation for my parents. Thank you for not stabbing me 37 times and leaving me in a state park. Amen. People have that happen to them. Can you say amen? amen? What would happen if a new generation of people rise up and unlike that grandfather in Allentown, they don't prophesy over their family, wait till you're paying the air conditioner. You know, you're eight years old having a good time with your 
What are you guys laughing about? Oh, we're eight. <laughs> you know, when you're eight, you don't, don't really have any cares. <laughs> Let me tell you. One day you'll be my age, you'll be paying the rent on this place. <laughs> People with unbelief always have mucus problems. <laughs> then you're going to see that life's not so funny anymore. You're going to see life serious. You don't talk to eight-year-olds like that. I told my wife, she's not here, so I'll say this, even though it's being recorded. She said, Camila, you've been playing on that iPad all day. I said, and she should. She's five. One day she'll be our age. There will be plenty of responsibility, but kids should get to have fun. Kids shouldn't grow up in homes where they're hearing how much money's owed. We don't know how we're going to pay the rent. No. What can they do to help anyway? Can you imagine the difference? If instead of growing up in a house like that, where your stupid grandfather's yelling back in the hotel room, just so you know, what a great prophecy. Just so you know, life will get harder every year. What an idiot. Glad I should, I'm a preacher and don't work for DHS. I'd have confiscated his grandkid on the spot so he has half a chance. How many of us grew up like that? Or somebody was telling you how hard life's going to be. Wait till you get married. Church people are the craziest people you'd ever meet. When you're not married, all they do is ask you when you're going to get married. When are you going to get married, Jonathan? When are you going to get married? Uh, I'm 15. <laughs> the thing is, this isn't Tennessee. Not any time in the next three years. <laughs> then you go to get married. All the same people that were pressuring you to get married. Jonathan, can I talk to you? I heard that you're getting married. And I just want to tell you, marriage can make your life a living hell. I don't want to tell you how I know. It's not important. But I just hope you know what you're doing. Because it looks very different. I get people set up for every step of life to be a step down. Oh, marriage. Is that what the Bible says? He that finds a wife finds a ball, of, ball and chain. Is that in the Bible? Or does it say he that finds a wife finds a? And obtains favor from the Lord. I know what I was before I hooked up with the dollars. And I know what I am now. There's only one variable in that equation. A dollars. I was saved before we got married. So I had the Lord. But my wife didn't subtract from me. My wife added to me. Then you go to have a child. This is when you get married. When you guys going to have a baby? Um, we're at our wedding reception. Not right now. <laughs> when you going to have a baby? You should have kids. Oh, kids are one of you. Then, then you're, they say, you're, oh, I heard a doll is pregnant. Well, you'll never sleep again. <laughs> you know, that's not true. You'll die. You know, we took what's called a baby moon where you just take one final trip before the child's born to basically kiss life goodbye. <laughs> Is that what the Bible teaches about children? That children are a punishment from the Lord? Or does it say children are an inheritance from the Lord? I want to tell you something. My daughter that's five now, my wife was up preaching in Massachusetts, abandoned our family for two days. I had 48 of the best hours I've ever had in my life. I took that kid out. I took her so many places until she said, Dad, I, can we go home now? I said, no, I have one more place I want to take you. She went, well, I'd like to go home. I realized I wasn't taking her out for her. I was taking her out for me. <laughs> it's fun walking somebody around that's never done anything. They don't know. It's like, it's like having a prisoner released into your custody <laughs> that's been locked up for like 40 years. They don't know about any new technology. I was taking her ever. Yeah, and then you seem smart because number one, they don't know anything. And number two, even if you're wrong, they don't know anything. <laughs> just fun walked all around I took her to places that aren't even geared for kids I took her to that place Dave and Buster's you have to be 18 or older to get in with an ID or be with someone you, you know you know you're may not take a child to the best place when you're getting dirty looks from sinners you know I have standards where we played it. went on a virtual reality machine I'm, I never had done that Children did not end my life. Children are a blessing. You ask my dad in two weeks when I come up to visit him whether I was a drain. 
I'm not showing up at the house saying, Dad, I need $2,200. I'm four months behind in my rent. If you don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. No. If you raise your children right, they won't come back and subtract from you. They'll come back and add to you. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, this world, to use a theological term, is freaking crazy. They have everything backwards. Marriages are drain you. Children, I'm telling you, if you do things God's way, it'll actually start to build a life for you that you don't even want a vacation from. You're having too much fun in your own house with your own family. Who can live in a house full of strife? I'm going to tell you the first thing the anointing will do for you. I was on my heart this morning. I did a Facebook Live this afternoon, and I still haven't got out of my chest. The days of you having a strife-filled marriage and everything you pray about, being about your own problems in your home, that ends tonight from this day forward. From this day forward, you will experience the joy of the Lord in your own home. In Jesus' name. The blessing of the Lord makes a man, and he addeth no sorrow. Lift both hands to the Lord. Everything that adds sorrow to your life comes under a curse tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. And the Lord will visit your family. I said the Lord will visit your family tonight. And the curses that have run roughshod will be changed into blessings. In Jesus' mighty name. With your hands lifted, just begin to thank God out of your mouth. It'll change tonight. It's going to change tonight by the anointing of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' mighty name. If you believe it, let your amen be the loudest. Amen. amen. That guy, that guy's prophesying hardship to his own family. Imagine the difference when you have a mom or a dad, like my daughter has, like I had with my dad. God's going to, you know what my dad would say? Jonathan, every year life will get hard. No. Jonathan, keep living for the Lord. Keep yourself pure and God will use you. God's going to use you more than he used me. My uncle Ted tells Teddy, my ceiling will be your floor. You'll start where I finish. You'll do things fast. Hallelujah. Imagine the difference if instead of having some jerk, that's you're, you're, you're older in your family. Wait, you ain't do you see? You're gonna have, you think money grows on trees? No, but God has it loaded in heaven. He'll just dump it out. Grow on trees? God blew a wind and blew German money up. Again. Trees, you'd still have to pick it. My dad just had to peel it off his pants. That's God. I said, that's God. How many of you know faith doesn't make things easy? Faith makes things possible. Oh, really? Do you know an easier way to divide, a, to get across a body of water than going like this? And Moses lifted up his hand and the water divided and a strong wind dried out the ground and they walked through on dry land. Faith doesn't make things easy? That sounds fairly simple to me. Stretch forth your hand and divide the water. A man born blind and Jesus spit in his eyes and the eyes be, saw that's easier than a laser procedure can you say amen, amen. who got us expecting a life of hardship I know nice him. basically the way they teach Christianity in this country is that nothing changes after you get saved other than your eternal destination where if you read this bible everything changes that you were serving the devil and everything that comes with the devil was in dominion over you. And when you got saved, you transferred out of his kingdom. It's like if every regular person that serves the devil is down here, in the spirit, you stepped up onto the platform with God and it gives you his power. Brother Jonathan, I don't feel like I have any power. As long as you go by how you feel, you'll end up in a mental institution. Up one day, down tomorrow. I don't go by how I, I like what Smith Wigglesworth told Lester Summerall when he was 80. 
Brother Sumrall said, how do you feel, Brother Wigglesworth? He said, I never asked Smith Wigglesworth how he feels. Jonathan, I've been looking at your schedule. You must be tired. I don't know. When my alarm goes off, I get up. I don't care what my body, you don't fast asking your body what it feels like doing. If you do what this feels like doing, all you'll do is eat, sleep, have sex, and go to the bathroom. That's all your flesh is good for. It's an animal nature. I've been preaching for 16 years, and when my alarm goes off, my body still doesn't want to go to church. And it's my meaning. <laughs> you take dominion over your body. Say, you don't listen. I don't listen to you. You listen to me. That's what people miss. You're not this or this. There's a hidden man in here. The spirit man. Oh, Jonathan, my mind, my mind just gets these thoughts and I don't know what to do. Tell your mind to shut up. Say this with me. Say, my mind is not my master. My mind is my servant. And just like money, it makes a terrible master and a wonderful servant. I'm in control of you. The Bible says casting down every vain imagination and thing that would exalt itself against God. You know what that tells you? You can cast down thoughts. No, I'm not thinking about that. I was flying on an airplane overseas, put a movie on because it was a 15-hour flight. In the movie, the husband's wife dies and he has to take care of their kid. Well, my mind, boy, what would I do if I was with this? I'm not thinking. I shut it off right then. Not because it had dirty scenes or cursing, because it was getting my mind I want to tell you, that'll be just as harmful as anything else they preach against. Cursing, dirty scenes. If you watch things, they get your mind focused on worst case scenarios. Watching shows about people's sick children in the what would I do if that happened to my, it ain't ever going to have to happen to happen to your kid. Because we're not like everybody else. We're redeemed by the blood of Jesus. And part of our redemption is that we are now out of every, every sickness, every disease, everything that brings torment. Jesus paid a high price to bring you out. Say it out loud so the devil can hear you. Say, I'm not like everybody else. And say, I, sure as heaven, I'm not going to live like everybody else. When you don't live like everybody else, God allows you to not live like everybody else. What does that mean? When you make different decisions. I'm not cheating on my wife. I don't care if every show they release on television, there's somebody having an affair. That will never get implanted in my spirit. Amen. Getting one thing. I'm going to find a woman who appreciates me. Yeah, then three years later when you're in court, see how much she appreciates you. It's a trap of the devil. Bible tells you in Proverbs 5 and 6 exactly how that ends. How those kind of women are. She entices you to her door. But don't go in for it is the door to death. All these old guys getting sued right now. Hollywood, politics, everything else. Ask them if they could do it over whether, they, whether it's worth it or not. When you let your body rule over your spirit, not only will you go to hell, your life will become a living hell. But why can't people understand the flip side? If you allow your spirit, man, to rule and take dominion over your flesh and use your mind to meditate on the word of God. It'll make your life, as it were, days of heaven on the earth. <laughs> Hallelujah. I walked into Jimmy Swaggart's office, 83 years old. Nobody's in there but him. You know what he was doing? Wasn't playing Disney Crossy Roads. Wasn't no TVs in the office. He had two Bibles open. Didn't even notice I came in. Oh. Then when you talk with older men of God, call my Uncle Ted up on the phone. Even if you're his nephew like me. You know, I was in my prayer room the other day reading. And I saw that the Bible says this. Do you ever think about this and how the Lord did this? Meditate on my word day and night. Let this book of the law never depart from your mouth. And I tell you, says the Lord, no one will stand against you as long as you live. And wherever your foot shall tread, you'll be on land that I've given to you. Hallelujah. I will prosper you and give you good success. When you allow, when you allow God's power to fill you, 
The primary beneficiary is you. Then once God fills you with his power, then follow the other part. Meditate on my word day and night. And let this book of the law never depart from your mouth. Speak it. It's going to get harder every year. No. I've been telling Camila since she was three or four, two and a half. As soon as she could, I could tell that at least the words would get into her spirit. I mean, she'd make no reaction. She'd be sitting there in a diaper watching, you know, whatever uh, Disney show, Nickelodeon, whatever. And say, hey, Camila, you're a blessing. Wherever you go, you're going to bless people. I like many. <laughs> I wasn't talking to her head. I was talking to her little spirit in there. Hey, Camila, I said, I'll see. Just after I heard that guy, I thought, I'm going to do the exact opposite. Hey, Camila, see this nice car we have? Yeah. You know who gave this to us? The car store. No. Jesus gave this to us. And he'll be, he'll give you better things than he ever gave your mom and me as you keep serving him. He's a good God. Everything we have, he gave us. Because he does what he says. Oh, magnify the Lord. And let us exalt his name together. For he has done great things. Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. Praise. Did my Uncle Ted preach here? No. My Uncle Ted is the oldest of, of, of my uncles, my dad's oldest brother. All four of them are in the ministry. The first time Hallelujah. Praise God. You can't get lucky for as long as I've been lucky. There is a real blessing from God. I remember how I feel right now. I remember laying on a floor in Aroostook County, Maine. At a youth camp in an old tabernacle. Got dirt all over my clothes. And I felt the anointing. I said, Father, put your hand on me and use me. Help me to win people to you. And man, I was 16. I'm turning 38 into the month. What a wonderful 22 years it's been. Get around ministers. Not easy serving the Lord. Somebody should slap your head. If you listen to them talk long enough, you find out they're not even serving the Lord. We gave our lives to the missions field. We should have given it to Jesus. Instead of some stupid denomination. Hallelujah. I said Hallelujah. What a great God. When you get filled with the power of God, you'll help a lot of people. But the primary beneficiary will be you. It's a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and sing praise unto his holy name. You read these guys in the Bible that served God and didn't give up. Lived till they were old. People tried to kill them. They all died instead. If you stay living with, for God, do what he tells you to do. You'll never know a dry season. In every season, they bear fruit. Their leaves never wither. They prosper in everything they do. Somebody doubts the Bible and doubts God. How can you look at the nation of Israel and the Jewish people? How can you have a brain in your head and not see that there's a group of people that are the apple of God's eye. 7.5 million people surrounded by 220 million enemies that want them dead. 
and they can't touch them. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 2, around verse 28, that a true Jew is not one of Jewish descent, but one who puts their faith in Jesus Christ. That's what Paul said. So the same visible blessing you see on that nation is on me, and it's on you. But you're going to notice something in the Bible. Even if they were full-blooded Jewish people, God said this will only work. If you meditate on my word day and night and never let this book of the law depart from your lips, your mouth, by the fruit of a man's mouth will his belly be satisfied. Those people have never had any trouble with the devil. You know, the devil's really been attacking me. Satan said, uh, actually, I've been in Syria the entire time you, you're alive. He's only in one place at a time, you know. You're only going to find four people in the Bible that actually were bothered by the devil. So you're not as important as you think you are when you hear people talk like that. Devil's really been after me. Oh, I'm sure. Probably one demon that's like in summer school. People's problems are that they have a void of God's word in their spirit. There's nothing there. When Satan himself came to Jesus, how did Jesus get rid of him? Start waving flags and blowing shofars and praying hard. Come against you, Aaron. It is written. When he said it is written and quoted the Bible, Satan never even, Satan changed the subject. Okay. What about this? It is written. Okay. And this? It is written. Okay. Those are my three best. I'll be back later. I'm going <laughs> to regroup. Ministers, I started to say, used to teach. Life's hard in the ministry. It was like a badge of honor to be poor and struggling, driving a car that's held together by Christian bumper stickers. I'm telling you, that's how you were supposed to show up at a church. So that people just look at your car and your clothes and go, they need help. In fact, people would teach you, when you if you started to get blessed. You know, you, you probably shouldn't park that car in the back. Because if people see that, they're not going to give in your offering. It's like, you, you know, you were like a traveling, a preacher was like a traveling, well-dressed beggar. Might as well have had a stick with a bag on the back. My uncle's car was on the verge of not working anymore, which is a major problem when you're a traveling minister. And my uncle didn't have any money. This is early in his ministry. And he got a hold of some teachings by what they call faith people. What are faith people? Whoever thought that'd be a dirty word? Are you, are you one of those faith people? No, that's the, trust me, I'm full of unbelief. I don't believe God will do anything that he said, so you're safe having me into your church. What are you supposed to be? Without what, it's impossible to please God. You can't have too much of a thing that's born of God. Lift both hands all over this room. May God impart to every person tonight the glorious, wonderful gift of faith that'll take you from a common West Virginia person to a supernatural being who lives in West Virginia. In Jesus' mighty name. If you believe it, say, I receive it. My uncle gets a hold of these teachings that are all out of the Bible. And you know the one thing about our family from day one. If you can show me in here, I believe it. If you can't show me in here, I don't believe it. So you start seeing. It's not like there's two verses on faith. It's not like there's one verse that says you can pray and ask God and he'll, he'll give you what you ask for. It's all through. Ask and you shall receive. The opposite of how we were all taught. How many of you know sometimes God says yes? Sometimes he says no. Sometimes he says wait. What verse is that? I've been trying to find it. I can't even find it in the maps in the back. <laughs> Bible says, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be open. If you're, you're like, Pastor Luke, I don't know what God wants me to do. Yeah, seek. If you don't know, you haven't sought. Because he said, if you sought, I'll, I'll show you, man. Hallelujah. You can't spend time with God. And stay in the dark on what he wants you to do. And he'll lead you. And he only leads forward. Can you say amen? amen? Hallelujah. My uncle gets these teachings. Staying in the basement of the pastor's house. 
and says, Father, if this stuff's true, I need a car. I ask you for a red Cadillac and laughed after he said it. We couldn't afford to be on Cadillac property. If we went to a Cadillac dealership, they'd probably ask us to leave. Sir, we don't have public bathrooms. Please leave. <laughs> the next morning, my grandfather that pastored over in Worthington back in the 80s was pastoring this church here. And there's a guy that, I think he might still be around, Don Pyle. He was a car dealer around here, sold used cars. He was either in Mount Morris or here. Mount Morris, so yeah. So you see, I'm not making this stuff up. My grandfather calls my Uncle Ted. This is the 80s. No cell phones. Nobody knew anything. My uncle, it was the 80s. You couldn't post on Facebook, really need a new car. Please keep me in prayer. And then somebody say, you know, I have a car. And you say, oh, what a miracle. No, you were begging on Facebook and you got what, what you manipulated people for. My grandfather calls my uncle up and says, hey, uh, Ted, I know you need a new car. Don Pyle came to my meeting last night. Is it Don? Don Pyle came to my meeting last night and uh, brought a car and said, I got this. And I thought of you guys. Didn't know if you wanted it. And when I saw it, I thought, I wouldn't drive this, but maybe you'd want it. It's a Cadillac. And he said, I'll give it to you for $2,000. My uncle said, is it red? My grandfather said, how'd you know? And that's when you start thinking, gee, there might be a God. My grandfather used to call that the pimp mobile. That's why, that's why he, wouldn't, he wouldn't drive it. That's why Don Pyle brought it for him. He said, I, I don't, I'm not driving that. I'm a, I'm a preacher, you know. I don't do illegal things. But I have a son who he might like it. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I could tell you these stories from now till when roosters crowed in the morning of how the Lord did exceedingly above you know, you ask, I'd like a red Cadillac, and then chuckle to yourself, whatever. And then you get a call in the morning. Hey, there's one waiting for you. And he didn't have the $2,000, but my grandfather fronted him the money and made Ted pay him back. And he did at 0% interest. That's the Lord. Can you say amen? I'll, I'll tell you one more before I pray for you. Hallelujah. What a mighty God. I'm preaching in um, Fitchburg, Massachusetts, which is in western Massachusetts, way outside of Boston. It actually is very similar if you go to Western Massachusetts to West Virginia. I was thinking that when I was driving there. The roads, you know, like the main roads in West Virginia, it looks like a, like a civilized place. And then if you get like two turns off the main road, it's like, I need a Hummer. <laughs> or I'm, you can't make it up the hills in the summer. I can see that didn't go over well. You feel like I'm attacking your state. I actually like it here. <laughs> I'm preaching there and I see... A pastor in the back corner named Max Marcoux. And it was like the Lord just hit me with it. I was preaching on like this, like faithfulness and serving the Lord. I said, you see Pastor Max back there? Because my dad remained faithful in his ministry. My dad was in so much debt. My sister was born with a heart problem. My mother and her both had to stay for 30 days. And then, you know, they charge both of you. I'm never going to get sick. But I always thought, if I ever get sick, I'm just going to check into a Four Seasons and pay for a doctor. It's cheaper. You don't have some guy hacking coffin next to you. Can you say amen? amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. My mother had to stay in there for 30 days, and we didn't have health insurance. My dad, gross income, made $4,600 his first year in full-time ministry. That's not he cleared $4,600. That's total offerings, total partner support, $4,600. Then he's three years in. My sister's in the hospital for 30 days. You stay in a hospital for 30 days getting treated? You're going to need to rob more than a bank. Hit all the banks, hit all the liquor stores, and tap into Fort Knox, and you'll have maybe enough. So my dad is in debt like 50 some thousand dollars in 1983, which was a lot of money back then. Of course, you won't even be 50 grand in the hole now. But 50,000 back then, that was like house money. Like probably being like a quarter million in the hole now. So my dad would finish preaching a meeting 
You know, one place, they gave him a can of green beans and a honey-glazed ham after two weeks of preaching. That was the total, total offering. Then other places, you get $100, $200. My dad said the entire time that he drove back, it would be like the devil was in the passenger seat with him. You know you owe $52,000, right? You know you don't even have enough money for your rent. Why don't you take a look at that check again? $200 for two weeks of preaching. Why don't you do the math, genius? If you preach every week of your life, you'll never be out of debt. You'll never be able to pay that stuff off. And my dad said he could feel a spiritual oppression trying to drive him out of the ministry. He said, I'd have to pray in tongues the whole drive home just to stay sane. And then one day, my mother opened the mail. I was in the living room and saw it and started to cry. My dad got this look on his face like, now what? Hands the letter to my dad. My dad looks at the letter and he starts to cry, which is why I remember it because we weren't allowed to cry. I thought, now who's supposed to spank you? <laughs> I was hoping it was my chance for revenge. I said, Dad, what's wrong? He said, nothing's wrong. Just lift your hands and thank God. I didn't know what I was thanking God for. So I just lifted my hands and started to thank God that I wasn't getting spanked today. Amen. <laughs> thank you, Father. I'm being obedient. I will not be corporally punished. In Jesus' name. As soon as they put the letter down, I took a look at it. Balance owed. I think they had paid it down from like 57000 to 48000 in years. Balance owed. 48000 some dollars. Balance paid. 48000 Current balance. Zero dollars, zero cents. Somebody paid. We never applied for anything. We never. Somebody took our bill and paid that sucker off. <laughs> the thing that Satan meant to drive my father out of the ministry got taken out in one night. Anything the devil's using trying to take you out of the will of God, it won't survive till midnight in the name of Jesus Christ. That's a fact. But then you start thinking, why does the devil work so hard to get you to quit the ministry or get you to quit on the thing God called you to do. Here's that pastor sitting in the back and it all clicked. That was right at the time my dad was almost getting driven out of the ministry by financial pressure. And there's that pastor, Max Marcoux. Last week, I said, do you see that pastor back there? I said, his name's Max Marcoux. I said, he was an unsaved teenage boy who lived in Wellesley, Massachusetts, outside of Boston. And he was chilling with his friend. His parents didn't go to church. He didn't go to church. But he liked music. Went to Berkeley. And he said, uh, his friend said, well, I got to go back to church. And just like with you folks this afternoon, his friend, Max said, I thought you already went to church this morning. He said, I did. I'm going back tonight. He said, why? Twice in a day? He said, they have a guest speaker who's really cool. He has red hair and he plays the electric guitar. That's my dad. And they like music, so that was the thing the Holy Spirit used to draw him in. Well, typical American Christian, he never said, would you like to come? Max actually had to say, would you mind if I come too? He said, no, you can come. Sat in the back. And I said, what my, he yelled out from the back. He still has the cassette tape from the night he got saved as a teenager. He's 40 some years old now. He said, your dad preached on Bible prophecy. When my dad preaches on Bible prophecy, that'll scare the poo out of you if you're saved. <laughs> if you're unsaved, people turn white no matter what color they were when they came in. He said, your dad preached on Bible prophecy. April, 19, April 29th, 1990. I still have the tape. And he said, when he gave the altar call, my dad still remembers it. He said, he ran to the altar. You know, the people don't know. This one girl told me when I was preaching in Massachusetts, she said, I got saved when you were here last year. I actually was shocked anyone else came to the altar. I thought you were talking just to me. I thought people told me that you were there and you had addressed your whole, whole message to me. She said, when other people come to the altar, why are you guys here? This is for me. So Max runs to the altar. 
get saved as a teenager. Everybody say, that's not the end. end. Feels called into the ministry. Becomes the youth pastor at that church. And as he's youth pastor at the church, he notices two Puerto Rican twins that have started to attend but aren't fitting in with the group and kind of just stay over to the side. And if you're a youth pastor, you get a sense for this kind of stuff. Senior pastor too. There's people you can tell, like if they don't, if you don't make some kind of connection, they're done. They've come twice. They're not fitting in. They're out. So he went over and introduced himself. Hi, I'm Pastor Max Marcoux. This is my wife, Dee Dee. What are your names? Dallas and Magalas. Oh, you're twins. Yeah. We're so happy to have you here. And then he arranged some, would take them out with their friends so that they stayed plugged into church. And those two Puerto Rican twins, one's my wife, and the other is her sister that runs our ministry that gave their lives to the Lord in that youth ministry, got baptized in the Holy Ghost, and Max had me in to preach. And I was in that meeting with my wife there, 17 years old. I'm out of college now, so it's not like I'm scanning the youth group for potential dates. That's why I'm not in prison. Amen. Unless it's to preach, and then I'm free to leave once I finish. And I see this 17-year-old skinny, uh, I didn't even know she's Puerto Rican. I'm from Pittsburgh, you know. This was like the first Puerto Rican I ever met was my wife. I said, stand up, young lady. She stood up. I got ready to lay my hands on her. But before I could, I felt the Lord speak to me as clear as day. And I remember I was like hesitant to say it. Because the Lord didn't say, tell her she's called into the ministry. He said, tell her she's called into evangelism. I thought, Lord... Guys that are my age have trouble traveling full-time. A young lady traveling by herself, that sounds like a tall order. It turned out the by itself part wasn't going to be part of the equation. (laughs) I said, lift your hands. I said, said, I've never said this to anybody, particularly a woman. I said, but the Lord has his hand on your life, not just for the ministry, but to be an evangelist. And you will be an evangelist and lead people to Christ. And she started crying. I laid my hands on her. She went out under the power. And I left. And that woman's my wife. Never, never talked to her again for another four years when she was in Bible school. I'll even tell you how that one happened. When I got out of Bible school, you know, my grandfather... Now, you think if my dad quits the ministry, Max doesn't get led to the Lord. If Max doesn't get led to the Lord, my wife doesn't get led to the Lord. Your life is not just about you. If you'll do what God calls you to do, there'll be a ripple effect that goes out from you and people that would have spent eternity in hell and forget eternity. People that would have spent their life on earth in tears. Cry every day. Laugh never. You will come into their life. T.L. Osborne made one of the greatest statements I've ever heard. He was at a missions conference and they were saying, talking about this nation that hadn't received the gospel. And all the leaders started to say, this nation needs Jesus. This nation needs Jesus. And T.L. Osborne stood up and said at 80 years old, no, they don't. They thought he was losing his mind. They don't need Jesus. He said, they don't need Jesus. They need a Christian because a Christian has Jesus. And a Christian has the only Jesus that they'll ever have. People love to pawn everything off on God. Oh, God will do it. We pray that the Lord touches us. They don't need the Lord. They need you. Because you have the Lord, and if you don't take the Lord to them, nobody will take the Lord to them. Thanks for the two amens and one grunt, but it's true anyway. I don't know if I believe in that. Believe what you want. There's a reason why people that grasp that revelation shake the world, and the people, oh, Lord, we just know you'll do it. No, he won't. He's up in heaven going, thought I told you to do it. Go ye. Not pray me, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. And as you go, these signs will follow you as you go. You will lay your hands on the sick and they'll recover. You'll speak in new tongues. If you handle any deadly serpent, it won't harm you. If you drink any deadly thing, you won't die. In my name, you'll cast out devils. Can you say amen? Amen. Now say this and it'll rattle every religious bone in your body. Say, the world needs me. me. Say this, the world needs me me. to get full of God. God. It's the only way they're going to meet the Lord is if they meet a Christian who's carrying a lot. The Lord's power 
in their body like Elijah, uh, like Elisha did. Where when you're dead, if somebody touches your bones, they get healed. How many of you know we're just weak? And, uh, speak for yourself. The Bible tells you that you can get so full of God that the anointing will begin to overflow from you. And wherever you go, what's outside of you won't affect you. What's inside of you will begin to affect what's outside of you. Can you say amen? Amen. Say this with me. Say what's outside outside can affect me. me. What's inside inside of me me. will affect what's outside. Lift your hands and begin to thank God that you'll never be the same from tonight. Everywhere you go, wouldn't it matter if there was a million unbelievers, a million demon-possessed witches. When you show up, everything changes. Can you say amen? amen? I was at my home church about three years ago. Pastor said, turn and greet three people. So I followed instructions. Turned around. Shook the lady's hand behind me just to say hi. Don't touch my hand. If you do, you'll get sick. I said, lady, if I touch your hand, I won't get sick. You'll get better. You know, listen, you know what she said? You'd think if you said something that mean to somebody that early in the morning, she went, pray for me. See, people, it's not that they don't believe. It's like the father in Mark 9. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. People are just used to repeating. You watch how hard life is. If you touch around, I'm sick. It's flu season. I don't have flu season. I don't even have flu day. We're going to devote an entire three months of the year to the flu. It's flu season. Okay, enjoy mine. Everybody say, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Say, I'm blessed every season. I'm blessed. In fact, I want to tell you what's just flowing in my heart right now. I tell the wonderful people of West Virginia tonight, old and young, this harvest season will be your season of harvest. This will be the greatest, listen to me, this will be the greatest autumn that you've ever had. Can you have the greatest autumn you've ever had dead? No. So obviously healing and life thrown in for free. That's why I quit praying, Lord, keep my daughter healthy. I just started to pray, Father, make Camila a great blessing to her generation. Endue her with rare spiritual gifts that cause her to be a blessing to her age group. Well, she can't bless her generation dead. She can't bless them incapacitated in a hospital either. You can pray past need. You can believe past need. You can go on to Red Cadillac. You can go past Red Cadillac to whatever you have faith for. Father, I believe you can do all things. And the proof is I begin to declare that everything begins to turn around from today. There won't be one testimony of promotion in this church. There will be many Many people who testify that God located me at my job. There'll be changes in your financial realm. There'll be changes in the peace that are at your home. There will be many people here tonight that cross the line from Lord, I need help to Lord, who can you use me to help? You know, listen to me. Not only can you start off helping people, You can move on from people to where we're at. Lord, what city would you like us to take our resources to and stand on a platform and say, everybody who needs groceries, be here tomorrow night and we'll feed you. You shall receive power. It's more than just speaking in tongues, brother. The Bible says live in the spirit. Just because you speak Italian doesn't mean you live in Italy. Can you say amen? Amen. There's a lot of people who know how to speak Italian in church, tongues, but they don't live in Italy. They've never been to Italy. They don't know what it's like to live where you carry the power of God, where without trying, when you show up, it starts to unsettle things. I'll tell you a couple more things and I'll leave you alone. But by the way, no one has a further drive home than me tonight. If you do, you need to find a church that's closer to where you live. Everybody say this, wherever my feet will tread, I'll be on land that God has given to me. 
When I lived in Virginia Beach, I went to go get my hair cut. I just looked up a, a like, place close to my house that reviewed well online. There was no leading of the Spirit. And I went, got my hair cut, go to leave, and go, go to pay at the front desk. And the lady goes, you don't have to pay. And I said, okay. You know, I'm not famous now. And back then, I was whatever, like, the lowest level of fame is. People forgot my name in my own house. <laughs> I said, I don't have to pay. Well, she wasn't the stylist. She was the lady that ran the place. I know it wasn't somebody just like that was mad at the salon not making people pay. I said, she said, you don't have to pay. Well, I, I never asked again. You don't have to tell me twice. In fact, I got out of there in a hurry before she could change her mind. It's like in football, when they're going to review a play and you run a play real quick. Because I actually didn't have much money. So when she said, you don't have to pay, I thought, great. Left. Go back six weeks later after I come home from preaching again. Go to get a haircut. Go up to pay. You don't have to pay. Left. Third time, I had a little more money. So when she said, I told you, you don't have to pay. I said, can I ask why? So do you know me? Or do you know somebody in my family? No. I said, how come you never make me pay? She said, I don't know. Everybody's always fighting in here. And when you come in, it gets real peaceful. Huh. See, unsaved people don't know anything about the anointing. They didn't know I was a preacher. Because if you tell them you're a preacher when you go to get your hair cut, it doesn't matter how you tell them to cut your hair, they do it the same. They make you look like Jerry Falwell. <laughs> it's like, listen, I want it shaved up here in a hard part. Okay, and you, you leave. It's a blow dried thing. They make you what they feel like a preacher should look like. And I love Brother Falwell, but hair wise, we see things differently. Doctrinally, I'm, I like the guy. What did that mean? Obviously, there was a change when I came in there. Now, how can somebody not understand this? I, I alluded to it this morning. If you had a drunk stepfather or somebody that when they'd get drunk caused all kinds of problems and they walked in a room and you could feel the atmosphere change or a coworker, How many of you have ever been around somebody that when they walked in a room, you could feel the devil come in? That barber shop I get my hair cut at in Pittsburgh, this guy came in, talked to the barber that I led to the Lord, talked real quick, and left. And when he left, I said, that guy's a drug addict that just got out of prison? He said, yeah, how'd you know? I could feel it. When he walked in the room, not everybody that's on drugs is demonized. He was full of the devil. So if you can carry demonic power into a place, where people can tell there's a wicked difference, then why is it hard for somebody to believe that you can get anointed with the Holy Ghost? And when you walk in a room or a classroom or wherever, you don't even have to tell anybody who you are. They say, what is that that you have? When you come into this place, it feels different. Every one of you are leaving with that today. I said, every one of you are leaving with that today. This is my friend Kofi. He's an evangelist. He started traveling with me in 2014 or 15. Right around there. One time, I finished preaching on a Friday night. And somebody wanted prayer in a hospital in Pittsburgh. So he took me. Service finished. Don't get nervous. I'm wrapping up. But that service finished late. I think we got out at quarter to 12. By the time I got done shaking hands with everybody, it was 12, 15. I had to fly out at 6 in the morning. So this was the only time I could go visit them in the hospital and pray. So we went to Taco Bell. Parked and ate. Because you can't eat Taco Bell while you're driving. Or it looks like Al-Qaeda blew up a salad bar. <laughs> You can't even resell the car when you're done. <laughs> so we sat and ate in the parking lot about 1 in the morning, finished eating and drove to the hospital. Got there at probably 1.15. It was in April. It was about 38 degrees and rainy. You know how it is when you live around here. April can be 80 degrees or 8 degrees. It's 38 and rainy. Walk in. I said, I'd like to see so-and-so. It was a lady who I know, she was in her 60s, and all of a sudden went paralyzed from the neck down. No accident, no nothing. 
Couldn't even lift her hand to brush her hair. Her husband had to brush her hair. Well, you know that's a devil. You can't you just go paralyzed. And if it's the, the, the more demonic it is, the easier it goes. So I went. I knew this lady. Love her. I went up to her hospital. I got, you know, went to the security desk. Uh, Kofi waited downstairs for me. I went up to the, whatever floor it was, second floor. Walked in. You know, it's 1.30 in the morning. People are crazy. I walk in like this, you know. Hi, I need to see so-and-so in whatever room. Visiting hours are over. Oh, really? You don't have visiting hours at quarter after one in the morning? Thank you, because I'm very stupid, so I appreciate you telling me that. Visiting hours are over. Oh, thank you. I run on a very odd time schedule. I forgot it was 1.15 in the morning. So I said, I know. I'm not here to visit. I'm a minister. Oh, okay. Well, then go right in. So I go in. I go into the lady's room. She's asleep. It's 1.30 a.m. And a nurse comes in to turn the light on. I said, leave the light off. I'm not here to have a chat. I'm here to pray. I go over to her while she's sleeping. Put my hands on her head. You know, even the nurses. Well, was there a dance in town tonight? Yes, I just came back from my senior prom. <laughs> this is my 20th year as a senior. <laughs> you don't know any of it. I put my hands on her head. I said, you foul paralysis that sit in this body. I curse you in the name of Jesus Christ. I command you to come out of this body. I command feeling to come back to all the extremities. As I'm praying, she woke up with my hand like this on her head. And she started crying. And without thinking, went like this. I said, hey. No, I, I said, hey, you can't do that. She went. I said, what about your legs? She said, I still can't feel my legs. I took my cloth out. I said, in the name of Jesus, just like Paul did, I leave this cloth with you that I preach with today. And whatever's left to be done, I commit it to come out of your body. You know, I got a, a video message from her daughter 10 days later. They, the people were coming to fit one of those chairs that take you up the stairs. And it's with her walking up the stairs with her hands lifted, thanking God. But wait. So I come down, do all that. You know, it doesn't take long. Came down at about 135, 140. Kofi's waiting for me. Kofi said, give me the keys. I'll go get the car since it's raining. He's a nice guy. So he goes out and gets it. Pull, as he's pulling it around, I'm waiting. Obviously, it's me and the security guard. We're the only people in the lobby. As was previously stated, visiting hours, I found out, were over. <laughs> as I'm waiting for the car to come, and I don't use the word exhausted lately. I had preached two four-hour meetings that day and was flying out at six in the morning, and I had preached all week, two hours, a, you know, two services a day. I was done. And I hear the elevator door open behind me, and I hear, Brother Jonathan? I was this close to going, nope. <laughs> I turn around and say, yeah? Oh, my goodness. This must be God. We heard you preach in Weirton, West Virginia four years ago. And uh, God healed one of the two sisters. There's two sisters. They said, our mother is up in the fourth floor. She's in the final stages of COPD and has a huge rash on her body. Would you come up and pray for her? I'm telling you, I tried to summon every bit of courage to go, I will not. I'm sorry to hear about your mother, but I need to sleep because I'm not going to be any good to people in a mental institution going, ministry, ministry, ministry. <laughs> I said, yeah. I said, yeah, uh, I'll come. We go in the elevator. I kid you not. These two sisters have their hands lifted going thank you God we know this was God I still wasn't sure <laughs> we get to floor four they walk me into her mother's room and I kid you not they have her on morphine so I walk in at 2 a.m. in a suit and tie she thinks she's like hi you know next Peter's gonna come <laughs> Santa <laughs> she goes she takes her oxygen off. Ch Ch Jonathan I said, yeah. They said, Mom, you're not going to believe it. We went downstairs to go home, and he was standing there in a suit and tie with a Bible. They thought I was like, like a Bible. Like, like I just stand there. <laughs> ready for duty. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I'm, I'm going to tell you. 
When I prayed for that first lady, I didn't feel any. But when I walked in there, because of the, them all believing it was a God-ordained thing, which, you know, eventually you have to believe they were probably right and I was wrong. You could feel the presence of God in that room. And I went over to lay hands on the mom. I said, put your hands where your lungs are. In the name of Jesus. She had that deathly gray color in her skin. I said, I command there to be two new lungs. You know, I only have one gear. I don't have like a 2 a.m. gear. And a, so I was praying there like I pray here. I only, you know, I only go in one mode. Father, give her two new lungs. He said, you shouldn't be that loud in the hospital. If people don't like that, they should go to a hospital where I'm not coming to pray. Amen. <laughs> That's what I said to people that filed a noise complaint at one of our crusades. Why did you buy a house near where I was going to preach? So I'm praying like that, and I didn't realize how loud I'd got. But two of the nurses came in, obviously, to tell me to quiet down. And I kid you not, when they walked in the room with stern looks on their face to quiet down whatever the commotion was, they walked in, and it was like the anointing was so strong in the room they went, when they walked in. And nobody had their hands lifted. It's amazing how when people get in the presence of God, they'll just lift their hands. An increase yes. and a new dimension yes. of signs and wonders. Yes. Just like that man told me in South Africa, you talk about 1,000 here and 3,000 here, but you'll talk about 10,000. It'll be like that for you in the supernatural. Yes. It'll go from one testimony here and three there. To it'll be more than you can collect. People will think you're exaggerating till they come and see it. The thing you sought from the Lord's hand is delivered to you now. Yes. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.